Well, welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us for an important matrix presentation of research and a panel discussion on Asian women's representation in media. I'm Dr. Malik Moazam Dolat, and I'm joined by my colleagues, Professor Claire Crawford and Professor Caroline Heldman uh, from the Critical Theory and Social Justice Department. This event is co hosted by two other departments besides Critical Theory and Social Justice uh, the Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies Department and the Department of Media, Arts, and Culture as well as the Representation Project, which is an intersectional gender justice organization. The Rep Project is releasing its Asian Women in Media fact sheet today in conjunction with this event. And we're sharing a link to this research in the chat, so look out for that. And then please share it widely with your networks. Now, we'll have a lively Q&A session at the end, but you can put your questions in the Q&A uh, anytime you'd like. There's a button at the bottom of your screen. So just put them in there, and then we'll get to them um, at the end of our discussion. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, Professor Heldman. Great. Thank you so much, Professor Mahazam Dolat. And I am going to attempt to share my screen. I'm going to share just about three minutes of data from the representation project. Uh, and some of it new data, some of it longitudinal data. Uh, so from across the years on AAPI women's representation in media. Um, so when it comes to AAPI women's representation, um, this group makes up 3.9% of the US population, but only less than 1%, uh, in fact, half of 1% of the leading women and girls in film. So you can see that there's a vast underrepresentation when it comes to the stories that Hollywood is telling about the lives of AAPI women and girls. Um, and if you look uh, at what has happened in the past decade, um, the number of male AAPI leads outnumber AAPI women leads four to one. So although we have seen an improvement over time and we've seen an improvement for both AAPI men and women, uh, men are still outnumbering women when it comes to AAPI uh, girls and women as leads. 60% uh, of films from the last decade, the top grossing films from the last decade, had featured no characters, zero characters who were AAPI women and girls. And when it comes to TV, uh, we see a bit of a better representation. So 3.9% of the population compared to 3.1% uh, of characters in the top um, watched TV shows. Uh, we also see that six, about 64% of the top TV shows have no uh, AAPI women or girls as a regular in their series. So even though we see better representation in terms of overall characters, uh, the representation that the erasure of AAPI women and girls in the top TV shows in the U.S., um, is, you know, two thirds. It's pretty extraordinary. No Oscar has uh, won for best picture that featured an AAPI woman lead, meaning um, that, in, you know, we, when we look at awards, we use these as measures of what stories are elevated, what stories are most valuable in our culture. And what we find is that uh, we have never awarded that, this highest honor an Oscar to a story that revolves around the life of an Asian uh, AAPI girl or woman. Um, two Best Picture winners have been directed by AAPI women, um, which uh, is few and far between, but we have seen perhaps some movement on that in recent years. Uh, when it comes to the Emmys, uh, no Emmy uh, has ever won for, for best series that has featured an AAPI woman lead in the best comedy series or the best drama series. So we see a continued erasure of AAPI women and girls uh, when it comes to whose stories are being elevated. Um, some common stereotypes that come up a lot in our research for AAPI women, uh, they're featured as nerds, martial artists, um, they are featured as submissive, quiet, hypersexualized, infantilized, bejeweled, um, often a, as a controlling parent, exotified. Uh, to jump into some of these, for example, um, the tiger mom trope, right? Uh, the, an Asian woman character who is overbearing, who expects perfection, sometimes is hyper-religious, but is often these, these parents or women, uh, the tiger mom um, is policing her daughter in, in various ways, policing her sexuality. Um, and we see you know, this trope coming up again and again um, in when AAPI women are featured. Also the geisha girl trope, uh, an Asian woman who is uh, shown as 
sexy, seductive, um, oftentimes working as a sex worker. So the exotification um, of Asian women in US cinema. Then also the schoolgirl trope, this infantilization of Asian women or API women. Um, she's often wearing the uniform, a short skirt, ponytail, made to look younger than her age. Um, so these damaging tropes and stereotypes, when we, when we think about representation, we think about both quantity of representation, meaning how often folks are showing up, how often various groups are being represented, and then we think about the quality of representation, right? The stereotypes, the tropes, the dehumanization of those characters on both of those counts, whether it's quantity of representation or quality of representation, AAP, AAPI women and girls are underrepresented and they're misrepresented and portrayed in very damaging and negative ways by and large in U.S. cinema. And now I will pass the baton over to my colleague, Professor Crawford, who will introduce our fantastic expert panel today. Hey, hello everyone, hope everyone is well. I have the pleasure of introducing everybody on the panel today. So first with us, we have Dr. Shruti Makamala, PhD, clinical psychologist. She is a senior staff psychologist at the University of Irvine Counseling Center. Her experiences of being a first-generation immigrant and a woman of color in the U.S. have deeply impacted her personal identity and professional interests. Her areas of expertise, including immigration and acculturation, intergenerational communication, and mental health impacts of experiencing intersectional discrimination. She has a special interest in working with Asian, Asian American communities, especially Asian women, as they navigate personal and professional challenges. She is passionate about training the next generation of psychologists to develop stronger cultural competencies through increased awareness and knowledge and skill building. Her research intersects with and informs her clinical interests and is broadly focused on racial and gender based discrimination and its impact on mental health and lived experience. Thank you, Dr. Makamala, for being with us here today. Uh, next, we have Suen Pien is a Chinese American actress born and raised in Los Angeles while attending UCLA undergrad. She booked her second audition ever on a SAG national commercial. She has been a SAG AFTR actress since 2006, working with Emmy and Academy Award winning directors as an actress. She's been featured in worldwide press, Elle, Time, People, CNN, Popular Science and countless Chinese media for her Mars One candidacy. As a host, she's presented for a Nobel Laureate and U.S. Secretary of Energy and has also been a featured speaker on stage alongside presenters Ariana Heffington, Jerry Leto, and James Franco. She's been writing and directing and had her sophomore directorial project featured by The Advocate magazine. She currently stars in As We See It. Thank you for being with us today. Next, we have with us uh, Monica Lay. Monica is a co-founder of the Center for Intersectional Media and Entertainment and vice president of film at Miramax, where she oversees the development and production of features like He's All That and Madison Tomlin's Mother uh, slash Android. She joined Miramax from MGM, where she worked on such legendary franchises as Legally Blonde and Candyman. Prior to that, Monica, as an executive, was an executive at Paramount and Warner Brothers, and she launched her career at QED International and WME. As an independent producer, Monica's credits include The Art of Self-Defense and the documentary recorder, The, Mar the Marion Stokes Project. Monica hails from Long Beach, California. She earned her MBA from USC's Marshall School of Business and her BA from Stanford University. Thank you for being with us as well. And last but not least, we have with us Michelle Sugihara, is the executive director of CAVE Coalition of Asian Specifics in Entertainment. She's also an entertainment attorney, film producer, and adjunct professor to the Claremont College's Intercollegiate Department of Asian American Studies. She co-leads hashtag Gold Open, is on the uh, leadership team of the Times of Entertainment Women of Color, and is a founding member of the Asian Specific American Friends of the Theater. She is also an associate member of Cold Tofu, the nation's premier Asian American comedy improv and sketch group. An avid public speaker, Michelle speaks and teaches across the country on various topics, including representation in media, women in entertainment, diversity and inclusion, leadership, and improv for non actors. Thank you for being with us as well. What an incredible panel. Um, as you may have noticed uh, on this panel, we have an academic, we have an artist, we have an activist, 
And we have an industry insider. And of course, a lot of those categories of folks hold multiple hats, right? Um, I have the privilege of asking the first uh, question, which is, um, what are the most persistent issues with API women's representation in media? And Michelle, let's start with you. The most persistent issues you have seen over the years in terms of API women's representation. I think it's, we can look at it from both in front of the camera and behind the camera. And I think really you, you hit the, the biggest nail on the head in, in your slide about the common tropes and those are continuing. We still see it. And uh, I think that's something that we definitely would like to address and see decreasing. And then also it's the, the hiring on the practical side. Who is in the writer's room? What does the call sheet look like? Who is below the line? And are, are they being paid a living wage? Thank you. Um, how about you, Sue Ann? Most persistent issues. Oh my God. Um, this It's amazing that we're actually sitting here and talking about this issue. You know, I, I, uh, I remember starting at a time where um, I went to see my first agent and she said, I, you know, there's not a lot of breakdowns for Asian women. And this was, you know, I booked my first, I was Taft Harley into SAG in 2004. So you can imagine that journey. I was often the token Asian, right? Um, and if I had an audition theatrically, it, I had to do it with an accent. It was a very, you know, uh, <laughs> the, 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 every, you nailed that in terms of representation. I, I rarely saw uh, people like myself, an Asian American represented on TV um, beyond, you know, the stereotypes. So um, yeah, this is such an incredible panel. Thank you guys. What an incredible, team of people too. I'm just in awe. I'm like in awe of everyone here. <laughs> so <laughs> am I, Sue Ann, right? <laughs> the, the dream of actually talking about things to make the world a better place. I mean, this is where it starts, right? It really is educational mm -hmm. events, information, research. And of course, mm -hmm. that you're doing, you're, you're, we'll, we'll dive into that, but you're, you are mm -hmm. expanding representations of Asian women on US TV. Um, Monica, what about you? What, what is your analysis of uh, the most persistent issues facing API women and representation? I think from the studio side, it's two things that I've been able to observe. And one of them, it, to Michelle's point earlier, there's kind of a pipeline issue. Um, so often I try to push uh, Asian led, whether it's behind the camera or in front of the camera projects. And the issue oftentimes is that person's not experienced enough or they're not proven. And so it's really finding people who are willing to take those bets and really put financing behind those projects. And the other thing is I've been in meetings, marketing meetings where um, I've heard executives or marketing firms say that the Asian American market is statistically insignificant. Um, and uh, this is a real thing that's happened multiple times. And, you know, as, as a percentage of moviegoers, um, Asian Americans are pretty much indexing exactly where they are in terms of population of the United States. Um, they're not over indexing like black and Hispanic audiences might, but um, I do think that where there are films and, uh, and projects that television show, sorry, that have um, stronger Asian representation, we do tend to over index and actually show up as an audience. And so I do think that that spending power goes unrecognized. And it's a fascinating assumption, right, that, that folks who are not Asian uh, won't want to see stories about the lives of, of Asian people. I mean, the assumption, all of the income, the revenue, and viewership assumptions there. I'm so glad you're there to challenge that, right? And be that voice at the table. Um, Dr. Mukamala, um, what are the most persistent issues you're seeing with Asian women's representation? I think the persistent issues are related to the fact that Asian Americans, like other racial minority groups, are treated like a monolithic group by the majority in the in the U.S. Right. So, um, even when we say AAPI, we see a lot of AA, which is Asian American, but not a lot of PI. Right. Even though they're subsumed and assumed to kind of have these similar experiences, 
that's not true. Within the Asian American group itself, we see a lot of stories, and, and I think that's increasing now, of Korean, mm-hmm. Japanese, Chinese, Taiwanese Americans, but we don't see a lot of stories of Southeast Asian people, so Vietnamese, Hmong, Cambodian, who also make up a large percentage of the population. You're starting to see, I think, a lot more South Asian representation, like we had something in Bridgerton recently, right? Like those two characters who were the leads. Um, but even when uh, even when we do see that, I think there is a certain kind of representation. So just in my, and I'm not a, a media expert, but I think just in my kind of understanding, the people we do see, um, even in terms of if you think about um, um, body image and representation, I just wanted to pick up this thing about um, representing women who are thinner or right or look a certain way or represent a certain view that the majority holds of what an attractive Asian woman should look like. And so then we're also seeing certain voices that don't conform to that hegemonic view of attractiveness also silenced. So those are the things that I uh, have just noticed. Thank you. All right. Um, well, Michelle, um, as executive director of CAPE, you've been working hard to improve the representations of Asian people in the entertainment media. How do you advocate in that arena and have you seen any progress? Thank you. Yeah, so for us, really, the ad- advocating part comes from our partnerships with in the industry, it's really to be solution oriented and focus on a lot of the issues that everybody else just raised because that's really, I think, where we're gonna see the most change. A Gina Davis Institute actually, in their research, they came up with the finding that 80% of media consumed worldwide is produced in America. And so that really gives us a lot of responsibility, but an opportunity to really be intentional about what we're putting on screen and putting out to the rest of the world. And really for us, we look at it from a 360 degree view. And so the the work we do can be broken down into three main buckets that address that. And so the first is the pathway programs. These are like the talent development side of things. So we are in the 10th year of our writer's fellowship now and our alumni are writing on over 60 shows across every major network, cable and streamer. And then on the other end, we focus on the executives because they're they're the ones who have the power to green light the shows and shepherd them. So we started that five years ago. And so really with those two, we're we're building the ecosystem from the bottom up with the writers and the top down with the executives. And then we recently launched an animation program with Sony in the fall of last year. And so what we've tried to really do is look at the pressure points in the industry. And if you look at the end credits of an animation show, there's a lot of Asian Americans there, but very, very few in the director slot or in the leadership role. And so how do we focus on getting more people up into to leadership? And then the second part is referrals because we touch every industry or every sector of the industry because of where we sit we have the largest database of AAPI talent working in Hollywood. So we do end up doing a lot of referrals. For example, studios will reach out and say, we just greenlit this project. We're staffing our writer's room. Please send us a list of this type of writer. Or we have 10 episodes. We're looking for 10 directors. Who who should we be looking at? And then we also do script consulting because that's, again, focusing on the content, addressing, again, the tropes, and, and also all of the wonderful points that Shruti just brought up about the, the intersectionalities and even like the, the body size type I mean, things that often go underlooked or overlooked. I'm sorry, underrepresented and overlooked. And and then the third one is to really celebrate and promote the projects that do make it because this is still a business and we know that people need to watch it. And to the point about our our communities being overrepresented in coming out to support shows. I think that is still a really important thing that uh, we, all, we all need to, to support. And so uh, basically, so with those three pillars, we say that we're changing representation from the writer's room to the boardroom to your living room. I think that gives a really important segue here to this next question for uh, Monica. Um, when we're really thinking about you working and you're on the inside here, 
And so, as it were, you're in a position, considerable power, power in the studio. So how do you advocate that for better AAPI representations? And how open do you think the industry is to this progress? Yeah, it's not easy. Um, but I would say that uh, I have a handful of approaches. Um, one is that uh, I try to speak out against stereotypical representations, those um, uh, stereotypes that we were talking about earlier when Caroline was presenting the information um, that she's been able to collect. Uh, and sometimes this works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, this year alone, uh, in two of our projects, there were representations of Asian women, and one of them was the model minority Filipina girl, and one was a dragon lady, and I spoke up about both, and I was able to change one of them. <laughs> so it's kind of a mixed bag, um, and it depends on who we're working with and who the filmmakers are, and a lot of it feels very political, but um, I've been able to affect change sometimes. Um, then there are projects that I've originated or brought in um, that come from Asian filmmakers or feature Asian representation, um, API representation. And um, you know, one project that I have is I'm of Southeast Asian descent. And one thing that I've always wanted to see is a Southeast Asian princess on screen. And so I found a director who I really admire, um, who is also from that background and Together, we're developing a project that we're doing at Miramax. Um, and then the third thing I would say I do is it's all about hiring um, and the pipeline. Uh, and so I try to hire uh, Asian Americans or at least provide opportunities to be hired um, whenever possible. Um, and so that comes down to people on my team and especially I think writers and directors, the writers who are actually developing these roles for API characters, um, many of whom are intersectional, and then the directors who are able to hire department heads, cast, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, all of that taken in mind, I think it's, I'm cautiously optimistic about where the industry is heading. I think that there are a lot of executives um, and boards who are willing to listen to the case for diversity and, um, inclusion, but, uh, and we've seen a lot of recent success, success, I think, largely to the streamers in terms of awards, ratings, viewership. Um, and so I think that there is more attention that's being paid to these underrepresented audiences, but I think it takes time because there's the pipeline issue, the education issue of making sure people are aware of these uh, problems. And then my biggest thing is it's really about making sure that it's studios are putting the money behind their mouth or where their mouth is the money where their mouth is um and uh and i think that's the hardest issue because everybody has these dni groups and they're well intentioned but oftentimes when we do have films that are financed that feature an asian or pacific islander lead they're indies um, and so I have yet to really see studios commit in a substantial way um, and put bigger dollars behind uh, API female-led projects. Hmm. Well, that's, okay, so that's interesting. So Sue Ann, how does this look from your side? So if that's from the studio side, um, as a actor and a content creator, how does this look to you? Uh, what have you witnessed uh, experience in terms of representation and treatment and hiring and all that uh, for both on screen and behind the scenes. Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, just today in today's world, it's, it's night and day. I mean, I, I started at a time, my, my dog's like, he's like, he has like coughing. I'm like, oh no, it's kind of cough. Sorry guys. Um, but, uh, you know, I started at a time where, like I said, there wasn't a lot of roles for Asian people. And if there were, they were tiny, insignificant, or you had to like put on it, like especially Asian American, like Lucy Liu was the only person I saw on TV that I was like, oh my gosh, she doesn't have to pretend she's like some weird Asian lady that you know, she's American and she's powerful, she's funny. She's just like one of a kind. And so I think, you know, and we're looking at like, like, you know, Chris and I used to, we were like, oh my God, we're two leads on a show that were Asian. Like the fact that like Amazon had the guts to cast 
an Asian lead. I'm like an Asian female lead. This is insane. You know, that, that we're even like talking about like the Emmys and all of that. And you know, besides all that, you know, if it wasn't for my autism, I should have quit acting many, many, many years ago. <laughs> many, many years. So for me, I don't have a lot of faith in being cast as a lead, right, in anything. Although now I'm watching things like Michelle Yo and everything, everywhere, all at once. Insane, right? Crazy, which it's so amazing. They're, these films are doing incredible. Shang-Chi. So I'm, I'm starting to be like, maybe it's possible. But because I haven't seen anything for myself, I've started to create my own content. You know, I'm like, I'll just like make my own show. I have like things that I want to produce, like scripts I've been sitting on for like 10 years, 15 years, right? That's like, it's insane. And I was like, well, if no one's going to cast me, I will just write a role for my show, like, you know, myself. And so uh, it, it has been really fun. I've been, I've been doing a lot of that directing, you know, uh, executive producing, I have a production company. Um, you know, I just sent a one page out to you guys. It's insane. It's like, it's like very female Tarantino-esque, but you turn it, right? I was in a Weinstein movie and I, I was so, I was like so young, right? My friend uh, was, you know, it was a Hellraiser and she was like, oh, you know, I was going to quit acting. She called me up. We had done a commercial years ago and she said, just come and be in this film. And I was like, if I don't book anything, I'm going to quit acting. And I was like, well, that's a sign from the universe. And she was like, play the Cinnabite, like the mask, like scary character. I was like, no, 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 I want to do, I like, I'm, you know, I'm such a method, I shouldn't even say this. I'm such a method. I, I was like, no, this is going to be really great. I'm going to do like this whole backstory for my character. And it's like an Asian prostitute in Mexico, right? And it's like, what the fuck? And then she was like, no, Weinstein just needed to see some like naked women on TV. And because of my naivety, you know, as somebody with Asperger's, I, I didn't realize like, like I was told, oh no, you're going to be able to create this entire cool scene. And, you know, I was like, oh, she should have, you know, so I want to be able to, all the things I couldn't do in the industry, right? I want to take, I want to take like these tropes and break them down and create characters and make them humanized, right? I want to take like the sex worker stripper that is objectified on TV. I'm going to break her down to her tiniest, you know, bottom, which is like, you know, at six years old, seven years old, she had a sexual molestation trauma, things that I can relate to and talk about. And it changed her trajectory. And then she's doing, you know, I'm going to humanize women. And, and also keep our power and our sexuality intact in a way that we get to own it. We get to write the stories and we get to put it out in the world. And so um, I'm just like, I'm like rambling on with you guys. Cause I was like, there's, there's like an audience. There's people that are powerful that can do things and care. And it's been so long. I was like, please, I have projects. If you guys want to work with me, <laughs> I have pitches for you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Sue Ann, you're incredible. Thank you. Yes, right? You want to take this power and, and humanize women while maintaining our agency. Um, and this is a great tie-in, a great segue into a question for Dr. Mukamala about your research, because you focus on this. You focus on the effects of stereotypes on lived experiences. So what can you tell us about what you're, you have found in years of doing research on the effects of stereotypes and tropes? So the, the basic effect of stereotypes is I think they create a lot of pressure to kind of um, conform to the stereotype because when you don't conform to the stereotype, then you kind of face backlash because you're not meeting this idea that someone has formed of you in their mind. Um, the other thing I think to also remember is um, while mainstream media might not be depicting Asian women in a, you know, with all of the range of experiences, people are, um, they do get exposed to Asian women in many, many different contexts. You think of manga, anime, you think of pornography, for example, where the Asian fetish is something that is really, really big in, in the ways in which Asian women are kind of objectified, right? So if your views of Asian women are limited to these negative portrayals, um, the women you meet in real life will probably face that, that, um, that expectation from you, right? So I think um, as Asian women, I think there's a lot of um, uh, objectification, I think that happens, a lot of kind of catcalling, sexual harassment that happens. Um, and then on the other hand, you have this pressure to conform to the model minority stereotype, right? So this idea of the good Asian who's hardworking, who's really kind of, um, you know, keeps things peaceful, um, get become successful, is really good at, at, at education. I work in a mental health center, and so the number of people who come to me and kind of talk about conforming to that stereotype um, is, is a lot. 
Uh, the other thing I think I will also point out is that a lot of these stereotypes, if you just look at the, the AAPI focused violence that has happened during COVID, um, a lot of the people who have been um, recipients or at the receiving end of that violence have been women, have been women and elderly Asian American people, right? So this idea of the passivity of Asian American women, the fact that they might not be expected to fight back, they're easy targets. I think it really also in this world that we're living in puts their life in danger, right? Puts them at, at risk of developing trauma from the experiences that they're having. And then finally, I will say uh, the, the trope of that passive, submissive Asian American woman who's not a leader, right? The follower, the person who's in the back room kind of doing all of the back end work to make success happen, but the limelight is never on her. I think those tropes really hold women back in the educational field, in um, you know, in attaining leadership positions because the people who are making those decisions about who gets to advance and who doesn't are oftentimes acting from these stereotypes themselves. So it really holds back the personal and professional success of Asian American women and sometimes their personal relationships as well. No, thank you, thank you for that one. And I think this goes to go back, we're gonna go back to you, Suan here. So you're, you're talking about this project uh, is coming up that you sent us a, a good one pager uh, here. Would you like to tell us more? Uh, uh, what can you tell us about the project? Yeah, I mean, that literally like is just one out of many. I, I don't fit the mold of Asian people. I'm the, I've been put in jail as a teenager. I mean, I've seen it all. And I, it's actually in jail that I recognize there's a racial injustice. Everybody in jail was black or brown. And I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> Pardon my French. So um, yeah, I really, I came out of that with a strong drive to want to make a difference in the world. You know, that's actually something I could thank my autism for, you know, like the Greta Thunbergs, we have a strong social um, justice kind of drive. And so, you know, one of the things I was also discussing with several people was, you know, uh, this idea that we don't belong here, Asians. There, there were Asian Americans fighting in the Civil War. And I wanted to make that movie. I was like, this is an Oscar winning movie. I'm gonna, you know, like, why not? People have no clue. Um, I, I was born here. I was born in Los Angeles, of all places. So I grew up in the capital of all of it. Um, and so, you know, it, just an idea of uh, this thing about women too, this thing about perfectionism. I was, I remember working in a tech company. I was the first female hired full time. And, um, and men, men are raised in a certain way where, you know, you have 41% of the job done and you're like, I'm gonna go for it, this is great. And men support each other, empower each other, right? Women have this strong drive for like, you might have 99.8% of your work almost perfect. And I experienced this. I'm like, I've, I've been sitting on this like one page. I took it to Sony's female filmmaker years ago, right? I've been developing it. It came from a song from, you know, my wife. And still, I there's a part of me that thinks, oh, I can't do this. I can't do this. So I don't speak up about it. I don't pitch it. And I'm watching, you know, different people and men in the world walk around and they're like, I got this and I'm going to make you made it. Here's money, right? So money is power. If I don't get funded, right? Like I have to share pieces and parts of myself, my ideas, right? I don't have the money to buy, you know, a DP for a project I want, like on a music video. So I have to give away a director credit even though I'm doing all the work, right? Or I have to give away this project. Like even, you know, I, I brought on some writers and uh, I, I, it's, it's cut three ways with people because I can't afford to hire him as a writer for hire. So I gave it away, right? And that's like pieces of a body, pieces of a woman's body, right? That's the sexuality part. We have to give parts of ourselves away. That's what we're taught for what we want because we don't have power uh, or money or backing. And I think this can be changed completely <laughs> like entirely <laughs> however we want to do that so these are the stories that I love and personally would love to tell and talk about wow well thank you uh looking forward to seeing these projects um and I guess we'll we'll start to wrap up here uh for time and leave time for our questions uh and the questions that come up um but maybe we'll we'll end with this so um, well, let's go around the around the horn and we'll start with Monica, uh, then we'll just go go around. What media are you watching? What are you reading? And what are you listening to that has great representations of AAPI uh, women? Yeah, um, 
There's a fair bit. Uh, obviously, things like Pachinko, everything, everywhere, all at once, um, Bridgerton turning red. Um, but I would also say um, The Cleaning Lady on Fox is one that I'm really excited about because it's a network show that has a Southeast Asian American lead. Actually, she's not American, but Southeast Asian lead. Um, and uh, shows some real complexities of uh, Southeast Asian culture. Um, and then on the reading side, I think there's a lot that's happening in literature um, in terms of representation. So there's delightful books like Crying in H Mart. Um, Minor Feelings is one that I'm still talking about, even though it's been a little while since it was published. Um, there's an incredible LGBTQ book called After Parties that I really adore, um, Build Your House Around My Body, which has a really complex uh, Vietnamese American lead, female lead at its center. She goes back to Vietnam and has a uh, kind of magically real experience that's dark and heavy and um, mm -hmm. centered around her body and how it's been exploited. And so um, those are just some of the things I'd recommend. Great. I hope we captured that. I guess we'll get it off the transcript, uh, make myself a reading list. Um, how about you, Michelle? Watching, reading, listening. Yeah, I, I'm actually, I'm so excited to see the content that has been coming out and that's also coming down the pike. We, just as a side note here, we also have recently launched a short film challenge sponsored by Julia Gao and it's for women and non-binary filmmakers. And we saw so many, we had over almost 500 applications for four awards. And just to see all of the wonderful ideas and stories that I, I'm just so excited to see uh, the, the future of what's coming down in content. And even just looking at this past month in March on the feature film side, uh, we had Umma come out, which was written by one of our graduates, Iris Shim, and starred Sandra Oh, and Turning Red, of course, Everything Everywhere All at Once, starring Michelle Yo. I still can't believe that that's her first lead after all of these years. I mean, that, that just really, is incredible to me and blows my mind, but she is tremendous. And so just to see all of these happening. And then today, in fact, is the LA premiere of a movie called Marvelous and the Black Hole. It stars Mia Check, directed by Kate Sang and produced by Carolyn Mao. So I hope everyone can check that out this weekend. Very, very strong film, women led behind the camera as well as in front of the camera. And then on the, the book side, Kate, uh, has teamed up with MTV Books, and we have a book coming out May 17. It's called My Life, Growing Up Asian in America. It's a collection of 30 essays by wonderful co contributors from across the country, uh, from as many different intersectionalities and backgrounds uh, as we could, could get. And so hopefully people will keep an eye out for that as well. Awesome. Okay. Dr. Mukamala, what about you? Watching. So I'm, uh, I'm the parent of a toddler right now, so there's not a lot of reading happening, but I do, I think one of the, the spaces that I do find that is a lot of rich content that's already out there is children's books. There are these amazing books that I've started kind of to collect for my son and to give to friends like this, this one book called I Said Kiss in the Corner that's about this little girl and, um, you know, who um, has... Uh, you know, slanting eyes. And so she's wondering about it. So the entire story is kind of, you know, centered around that. There's this one that we're reading right now, which my son loves, which is called Bilal Cooks Dal. It's about this little boy who's cooking dal with his, with his father and inviting all of his white friends to come over and they all kind of taste this food, um, South Asian food. So um, he loves reading it. So I think I'm discovering a lot about just representation at different levels. Um, while reading stories with him. And I think there's a huge space for people who want to create content in that area as well for little kids. Um, and then I think I can never say enough for never have I ever. I think that show just is representation of um, a second generation API woman, a South Asian woman, just grief. You know, they have such um, human representations of 
non tiger parents uh, you know girls doing arts right asian girls in who are interested in acting and art and i think they just um the ways in which they um tackle representation um and do it so funnily and in such a poignant way i think when i need something i need a break from life and i just want to go back to something i i will look at never have I ever um the recent show that i think that was also by mindy kaling the sex life of college girls is also interesting um also just very fun representations of empowered women trying to make their way through college which i thought was uh, really fun in the first season wow um the children's books sound amazing um get a collection of those sue ann what about you De um, definitely everything everywhere all at once my mind was i mean go, i like yeah as as you know i have a wife so you can imagine how well that went over <laughs> and my family and to see it portrayed on screen it's life-changing this is going to change communities you know I, I remember telling my mom i was going to marry my partner and she said can you please not do it until it's more accepted in the media she literally said that because you know she was afraid it wasn't going to happen and you know, and and uh, in the Taiwanese newspaper, like wrote about our marriage because of my Mars One candidacy at the time, and she she learned from them. And she was really upset, and so I think when you see movies like these and you see different portrayals, um, even Violet, I am I am so so um, I'm so honored, and uh, I mean it, it's unbelievable that I get to play a role that means so much to me. Has show and it's it's not about. Her, you know, Violet's ethnicity uh, and whatnot, but she's a full character. I finally, there's a role that I can bring all of my acting ability, skills, talents to, to portray in a way that, you know, like I've never read a character that would have allowed that um, before today's world, you know? And so um, just so grateful the world uh, and media and entertainment is changing and leading the way. Um, but definitely everything, everywhere, all at once needs to be seen. <laughs> it is so good. Okay, so we have our watching reading list. I'm going to add one more. Uh, the Rep Project, uh, we have a, a book club, right? And we're featuring, each quarter we feature a book. Uh, the book this quarter is Pizza Girl uh, by Jean Kyung Frazier. And it features, uh, well, I'm not going to ruin the story for you, but an Asian American teen mom. And we are interviewing the author on Tuesday at noon, if, if y'all want to tune in. It's just amazing. And a couple of quick things. Michelle, you mentioned that Michelle, Yo, this is her first uh, lead. That's unbelievable to me. I guess I just think of every film she's in as she is the star. <laughs> um, and Dr. Mukamala, um, I, I have completely uh, set my algorithm because I watch Never Have I Ever like at least once a month. So I'm right there with you. Um, amazing, incredible suggestions, folks. Let's uh, jump in uh, to some questions here. Jasmine Mack has a great question. Uh, Munika, let's go to you first. And then Michelle, what are the ways that as consumers, we can uplift and support APIDA women in media, Munika? Uh, yeah, I think it's voting with your eyeballs. <laughs> <laughs> um, and with your dollars. Um, so it's finding content, some of the content that we just discussed and uh, making sure that you are watching it, watch it on repeat um, and, uh, and go to the theater, I would say. Um, that makes a huge difference because in our line of business, especially on the film side, we still rely so heavily on predictive models that are based off of how theatrical performs because the data from streamers is exists in a black box that nobody except for Netflix or Amazon or Apple can access. And so what we can access is box office data. And that's what spit out in an algorithm that says this movie will make money or it won't make money. Um, so that's how we make our decisions. Great. Thank you, Monica. Um, Michelle, what are ways that as consumers we can uplift and support APID women in media. Yes, I want to underscore a thousand percent what Monica just said about voting with your dollars and your eyeballs. I know we're all very screen timed out, but if you, you do see go to see a, a film or turn on a series, you can be more intentional about what you are watching and who's in front of the camera, who's behind the camera. And then also if you know any 
women or non-binary people who want to get into this industry, please encourage them because I think that's also something historically in our communities that has not necessarily been encouraged. And so even with the film challenge I mentioned earlier, we do that in partnership with Janet Yang Productions. Janet Yang is a powerhouse producer that's been in the industry for, for many years. She's a governor of the Academy and, and really also just a champion of women and non-binary filmmakers. And what we really saw was people saying, this is the first time I've ever written a script. And so just to see so many people just even trying their hand at it and it was, was really remarkable to see. So I, I really am excited for the next generation. And so please encourage anyone that wants to get into the industry that it is a viable business. Great, thank you. Um, question for Sue Ann, what would be your dream role to see for AAPI women? Oh my God. Um, well, Violet from As We See It is definitely, if you guys haven't seen it, I mean, we don't know about a season two yet and we need eyeballs probably. And like, just go, it's amazing. It's like unreal, unlike anything you've ever seen. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the things, my, my family, there was this uh, political figure in Taiwan. Um, she was General Chiang Kai-shek's wife, So Mei Ling. I would, have, I would love to play that character one. I, I grew up hearing about her. She was very much involved in American politics, you know, with Roosevelt and the, also in the Taiwan side. So that's a very powerful, interesting figure. Um, and also, uh, uh, you know, I wrote, like I said, you guys on one page, I was like, I've always wanted to play vampires. I grew up in the eighties. I love the Lost Boys, but I want to do like a Lost Boys, like the Lost Girls, right? So I created this story and it's funny, Monica was talking about um, princesses. You know, I, I recently found out in my heritage on my dad's side that if if things continued as they did and, you know, my family didn't become refugees in Taiwan, I'd literally be like a Chinese princess, which would be awful because I would have just been like, you know, married off or something like I was like, and, you know, for for like a little kid like me that all the things I want to do, that's that world is too small. So I want to expand the world and, and just you know, and play and, and, you know, there's other things I've been doing that I can't talk about right now anymore, but it, it is on the production side. It is very, it is very, very exciting. And so space. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that one. No, I think that's also like, when we think about our imaginations, I spent a lot of time thinking about otherwise, but like, what is this alternatives to like, what it is when you talked about getting down to this like small, grain of how people come into being. And so I wonder, you know, oftentimes when we think about ways, other ways that we see, um, what are some representations and forms of media that change how we see AAPI women is one of the questions that we got. So amateur films on the guard, maybe even some short films, like, like how does that, does, is there a different way that, that uh, AAPI women show up in those types of films that maybe we just haven't engaged with or don't know where to find? Well, that's a tough one, right? The yeah. political imagination. Um, Michelle, did you, it looks like you've got something to say. I think that's really where, it, that's fun, right? That's really where we can start to see all the different places and, and even podcasts and like what, what's coming out and even video games. I, I think actually video games are something that we should be talking about more as just as an industry there it's four times the size of film and tv in, in terms of dollars combined and so i've been really impressed to see some of the narrative things on the video or video game side so i i think one of the the points though that i also want to revisit is something that shruti brought up earlier and, and that's there's this acronym right aapi and everybody like kind of slaps it around throws it around but it really is two very distinct communities. And even within those communities, they're all very diverse. Right? So Asian Americans and the Pacific Islanders. And I would just like to see more, like more Pacific Islander stories. And some of the stereotypes that Pacific Islanders face are more akin to indigenous and their history of colonization than it is with Asian Americans. And so really want to make sure that we, we are seeing that, that split and 
And also when you call something AAPI, is there really PI representation because that's half of the acronym. And it's only in America that these two groups are lumped together for political reasons. Nowhere else in the world do our Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders lump together. And so it's just something that I, I would like to see more intentionality around. Yeah, that's a great point. And I'll, I'll point back. So we're on, we're doing a series of intersectional women and we did um, a, a panel on a fact sheet specifically on South Asian women. And you're right, Michelle, we have this ongoing conversation about, you know, the politics of the category. And it's really, I mean, even within the category, the diversity within the category, um, as you point out, only in the U.S. do, do we lump this together. Um, and, and, Thankfully, we're being more granular and more kind of focused on that in, in terms of the fact sheets and the numbers. Um, but, you know, it's it's a wonderful thing that you're bringing up. Right. And, and even within East Asian, um, you know, nationalities, there's also a kind of a, an erasure, right, of just an incredible abundance of diversity in terms of cultures and nationalities. Sue Ann, did you want to jump in here? Yeah, no, I love that. It's funny because growing up here, it's like I have my Vietnamese friends. It's a very unique, you know, culture to go into. And then my, you know, Filipino friends, like, you know, it, it's like it, it, to lump it all together, like you said, <laughs> is, is it's very American and it kind of like point blank puts all of us, you know, all of us in this like category and there's so many different nuances you know I think my one of my friends I did this short film with many years ago um she was on Black Lightning Chantal Tui and she's doing a really cool Vietnamese uh, based you know story now and so I'm watching as um as storytellers because I think you can only write about what you know right you can only create what you know about and um, I think it's important that more people feel empowered to speak up and know that their films will be seen um, if they create something that calls to them that they are empowered. So incredible what you guys are doing at Cape, Michelle. Like all of the, you know, it's so it's like so cool. It's it's incredible that you don't have to like you know. They, I remember roles right in front of the camera. It like anybody, every Asian ethnicity actor would go in and try to play like the Chinese role or the nobody cared right nobody cared about these like differences like no that's a korean role <laughs> so um thank god you know all of that is starting to change and hopefully we can put money behind it and studios can get behind it because i think it's, i think it's it's proven you know these movies are doing really well shang chi was incredible it's doing so well um and it's time it is it is our time yeah <laughs> <laughs> Can I just also add to that question of, you know, um, how we as audiences, I think there's a dearth of just given that forever foreigner stereotype that the Asian American group faces in general, there's this idea that Asians have only existed in the US for the last 40, 50, 60 years. I think we need to do a lot better about the showing the history of the Asian American group in the US, all of the different groups that came at different times, talking about, you know, activists like Helen Zia, Yuri Kochiyama, right? There are so many interesting Asian American women stories uh, that are based in the history of the US and, and we don't know about them, right? So I think even we as audience is kind of demanding stories like that, you know, uh, if you're a parent, like going to your school and talking about, right, uh, getting these stories uh, told to our young, young kids. Um, and then uh, if you're someone who's writing or, you know, interested in these lives and wants to create content kind of focusing on some of these characters who are there and their lives um, have affected America very deeply. Um, so I think really kind of also looking into the history of this larger group and kind of bringing things forth from there as well so that people know that this is not, a, uh, Asians have existed here for centuries. Yeah, I, I just want to say one of my best friends as a teenager, you know, she was part of a Vietnamese fishing community in Galveston, Texas. They were harassed by the KKK, which were, they were, the KKK would show up, they were the sheriffs in town and, you know, they burned crosses, had rifles and this really famous lawyer took on their case and won each of the families like a million dollars. They went on to create restaurants and business. So, so there's a, like, we're part, we're ingrained in American history. Like I said, back down to the Civil War, there was Asian Americans documented fighting on both sides of the Civil War. That's insane. Filipino Americans, the Boxer Rebellion, I don't know if you guys even know, they were Catholic Asian people that were fighting in the Boxer Rebellion. 
we, you know, we belong here. We're part of the tapestry of America. And I think these stories need to be developed and told. Actually, if I could just jump in on that to go back to my podcast point, that there is a podcast out, it's called The Burning Bayou, and it is about the KKK and the Vietnamese community. It's written oh. by Derek Wynn, and it stars Chantal Thuy, who's <laughs> mentioned. So this is all in full circle. There we are. Ah, and can I just put a, a, la, a final kind of um, capstone on this that everything you've been saying about diversity and humanization and better representations, obviously more, but also better representations. Uh, the Center for Scholars and Storytellers just published a report yesterday finding, and, and Munica, this ties directly into your point, finding that the more diverse representations and the more authentic representations lead to more awards for shows and also higher box office returns. So folks are leaving money on the table if they're not getting representation right. That's right. $75 million is what that report found is being left on the table when you don't have authentic stories. And can you guys find the link for that? Oh, we will put that in. I'll put that in the chat right now as uh, Malik yes. is the show. So thank you to this amazing panel for the uplifting, despite the topic and the problems, uh, conversation. Um, I, so we'll we'll post this. Um, it'll be available. The video will be available. And um, you know you can look to your emails, everyone who registered and so on, and please share it. And in there, we'll hopefully be able to share some of the uh, sources that everyone's talked about here, all the you know text, and movies, and all that. So there it is in the chat. I was just stalling uh, till that was in the chat. So thank you. Uh, so everyone get a quick copy of that. Um, the Burning Bayou podcast I put in the chat and the link to the Pizza Girl Q&A um, uh, that we, was discussed earlier is in there as well. Thank you to every single one of our panelists. And thanks to everyone who's uh, watching now, later, whenever. Um, and take care of yourselves, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Incredible panel. Thank you. Thank you.